recording. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, folks. It's me, your friendly webinar facilitator, Krishna Vedula, and we are we're going to have one of those days where we got 500 people showing up for this webinar. Fantastic! I hope everyone is going well. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in different parts of the world. I hope you are safe and healthy and happy. We have for you uh, Dr. William Oaks, our speaker for today. A 10th webinar you know, that we've been having in the series of for connecting the global community for online learning, for online, for the area of online teaching. Okay, the um, presentation today is on something that's uh, very challenging. It's difficult enough to do uh, project work with teams face to face, and uh, Bill has taken on the challenge of doing that online. So amazing. We look forward to hearing from you. Uh, all of you know, uh, many of you know Bill already, but uh, let, let me go through this anyway. You're with him. Uh, he's a 150th anniversary professor, director of EPICS program at Purdue University, an engineering education program, and a registered professional engineer. He's one of the founding faculty members in the School of Engineering Education, and has had appointments in mechanical, environmental, eco ecological engineering, and curriculum instruction in the College of Education. Uh, he was the first engineer to receive the U.S. Campus Compact Thomas Eric Faculty Award for Service Learning, co-recipient of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering's Bernard Gordon Prize for Innovation Engineering and Technology and Education, and recipient of the U.S. National Society of Professional Engineers Educational Excellence Award, fellow of the American Society of Engineering Education and National Society of Engineering Education. Wow, we've got a great uh, distinguished person with us today. I'm going to hand the screen over to to Bill and uh, making the presenter. Come on in, Bill. Well, I want to uh, repeat what Christian said. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, what, whatever the time is. Um, I volunteered to uh, to do this webinar, and um, I, I'm excited about it. And I'll share. Whoop, wait a minute. Ah, there we go. Um, what I want to do is I want to put a little bit of, of context in, into what um, we're doing. Uh, talk about strategies for managing teams, uh, team meetings, breakout, uh, how we keep records, um, documenting and, and uh, assessment, some ideas on, on for, for projects and, and trying to, to leave some time for questions. Um, I want to be really clear that after I volunteered to do this, I thought, wow, um, if it, I, I would imagine if, if, if I were to see this, I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to have a, a lot of great magic answers to make things go perfectly. And in today's environment, I don't think there are any magic answers, but we're going to show you some things that, that we've got to work. Uh, very much believe that we learn together. Uh, when we do project-based um, learning with students, I find that often I, I learn it, it's much or more than, than the students. And I think in this environment, we as colleagues are, are, are going to do this. I also think it's very important for us as educators to remind each other and especially remind the students that we will get through this, that, that, that we at is human beings have been through economic challenges and, and, and natural challenges, and and we will get through this, and it will be hard. Um, you know, when I say we're going to get through this, it it, it doesn't. I, I don't mean to diminish the 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 pain and the suffering uh, that that's going on, but I think it's very important for our students that have never experienced this. I think many of us that have lived uh, that that are older. Um, have seen things, and, and I think as we do this work, I think the project-based work and, and the other things often give us more times to have conversations with students, and I think that that's something we have to remind ourselves um, and our, our students. I really believe that, that um, and, and I appreciate the uh, number of colleagues that I know that, that are on this uh, share the delusion that we can make the world a better place. And I'm one of those people that really believe that we can make the world a better place, but none of us has a solution. They're all pieces. An image that I look at is is a, a, a puzzle piece. And, and today, what I hope is, is that we're able to bring up a, a, a few of those 
um, together. When I think of, of learning, and, and I was putting this together, um, uh, Kolb had put together a, a learning cycle that talked about the different kinds of things that, that go into to learning. And when I was looking at this, one of the things that I realized is, you know, in a project-based work, it's an opportunity for them to get a concrete exper experience to, to apply things. In the online world, we're more on the right hand and in lower side. And I think a challenge for us is to give students the opportunities to still experiment in some ways. That does not mean that we're gonna be able to balance. And I think that we have to, in the design of our curriculum and just of our experiences, we're going to have to understand that things are going to be less balanced. Now, the work that I do is in community-based work, service learning, and, and I wanted to use the word service learning because there are activities that I do in ideal work, these, were, these things would be balanced, the work that we do and also the learning. I changed this because in this season of um, our, our teaching and learning, the students are probably going to be doing a lot more learning. Now, if you're not doing community-based instead of service product or result or uh, I, I accomplishment, but when you think about the things that we think about the project, realistically, there's going to be less progress on the project, and there's probably going to be more focus on the learning. Uh, the students are still getting academic credit, so we need to make sure that we're providing things that push their learning, um, where they can learn about the discipline. Uh, we still need to do assessment. And they're also, remember what we're doing is laying the foundation, the project-based work that we do. The goal is not for the project that we can show our colleagues or have a poster session or enter a contest. The, the real purpose of the project work is to lay foundational skills for our students to do great things later. Now that doesn't mean that the, the project didn't have value. In our service learning work, every project when it's finished is used by somebody and there's no question that that has value. But I think if we take a step back and we look at what we're doing, there's an important piece that we can still accomplish and that's laying the foundational um, skills for life and their uh, later in their careers. Um, research that we did, when I think about how we need to approach these, I, I go to some research that we did with uh, practicing engineers that had gone through the service learning and they talked about the balance of a set of things, and I have three of the things here. They talked about how the work that they do in our classes is safe and it's real. Now these graduates, when they talked about safe, they realized that once they're in an industry, if, if, if they did something wrong, they could lose their job. Uh, in the classroom, or, or whether it's physical or virtual, they're, they're not gonna um, lose their job. They, they just might not do as good a job on the, on the project or may, might have a, a lower grade. So the safety in this allows them to experiment. <clears throat> they also talked about the balance between some structure and freedom. And this is important. As we try to figure out how the students are organized, the, the research shows that we don't want to overstructure it. We, we don't want to provide them with all the answers. We want them to play with things and experiment. And, and I'll tell you one of the things that, that the students are much better at online communication than, than my generation. Um, and, and so they've actually got some skills, whether they um, realize it right away or not, and so it's given them some freedom. They do understand what we're doing as education and practice. And so being honest with them that we're gonna be a little heavier on the education right now uh, they're going to understand. The, the other thing that came up in the research, and I think this is important, that we're giving them this experience, how you pivot a group, or how do we do things when we're separated, is going to give them experience later. They're going to be, in today's connected world, working on virtual teams. 
And so even within this crisis, even within the, the, the chaos that, that it's created, helping them process that these kinds of things that they need to do. The next time we have a crisis like this, that hopefully is, is far away, but likely our students are gonna be the leaders making business decisions and, and other things. So helping them process through and, and get through this is gonna lay a, a, a foundation. Now to give a little context, um, when, when this all hit at, at our university, and we've been, oh, I lose track of time, about uh, five, six weeks ago, it was clear that we're gonna have to, to move online. We had almost 600 students involved in about 120 projects. We had first year students through fourth year, different disciplines. All of our projects had a real partner, whether it's local or a global partner. And we've had to shift all these teams um, online. It is not the same experience as when they had on campus, but it's gone, I think, much better than many of us um, had feared. And I wanna provide some context. I also just wanna be clear when I think of these things, I'm thinking of what we can do in, in, in large groups. I also wanna put something in that what a lot of us are dealing with right now, well, those of us in the Northern Hemisphere are dealing with is what we've done is we've moved online things, um, moved in-person thing to online. And, and the research shows that the teams are very different. The experience is very different if they've had an opportunity to meet. Uh, there's some research that even one meeting in person improves the, the, the virtual meeting. Um, as we move forward, um, if, if we need to move this into another semester where we're starting, there, there are differences um, in, in, in that approach. And I just want to mention that, that, that we need to be even more intentional at the beginning of, of forming teams, that, that we can make things work right now. Um, but in some ways, we, we, we've gotten a, a, a head start, and that may be part of a, a future conversation. So let me show you what our course structure is and some of the things that, that we've done. So we had a two hour in-person lab. Uh, we also had learning activities that we call PDHs, professional development hours. The students um, had a menu of things. Uh, they, they could do hands-on workshops. They could, they could go listen to speakers. Um, and what, what we've had to do it, is we've moved those online. Now we followed the same structure that the two hour lab is now a two hour synchronous meeting time. We've had to make exceptions because we have students literally all over the world when, when they left and we've had some with connection problems and we're dealing with those with the exceptions but the vast majority are still online and, and I'll um, show you what, what those are. The learning activities, we, we've not reduced any of our requirements but these have all been virtual sessions. There's a, a YouTube channel. Uh, if you go to the EPICS website, uh, if, if, or if you wanted to contact us, we, we could uh, point you to those. But we're, we're free to share that. We also had in our structure, obviously the, the students would meet themselves outside of lab. The, the, the teams would meet during the week. And this has also gone online. We allow the students to manage that. And what we've seen is the students are able to have their, their online meetings, but we do not provide the infrastructure uh, for those. An important part, I, I think something that's helped us, um, it is our team structure. And when I think about our, our teams, that we combine multiple project teams. So these columns down here are intended to show project teams. Each project has a design leader. And then we have um, different um, office positions. So for, for the class, there'd be a liaison with our, our, our partner. The project archivists are the ones that are the key people for the documentation. Financial officer worries about budget, webmaster. And one of the, th the things that we look at is our student project manager is really a co-leader co with us on these teams. So as we make decisions, we get with those that student. Sometimes we'll have two students 
that are in, in charge of a, a, a section. And philosophically, even with this chaos, we provided them with some guidance um, and, and, and sought their opinion. Now, if I go back to that slide, when I talked about structure and freedom, we did dictate some structure. We gave them, here are some of the key technologies that we need just be, because we needed um, to reduce the variation in our program. We use a WebEx, that's what our university has. It's, um, it, it is a, a main, or is one of the platforms. And then we have go to meeting rooms for each of our, our classrooms and, and we, we've used those. Um, but we've engaged students as, as partners and this has given them um, authority, responsibility, it, it's forced them to make decisions. It's also given us insights into what the students think will work. Um, and and it, it, it's allowed us to negotiate. <coughs> now, I want to, um, so our class, it is broken up into these sections. Most of these section sizes, a project manager would be in charge of between 12 and 24 students. It is our section size. We have one team that I'm involved with. It's the Engineers Without Borders team. This one has over 70 students in it. Um, and a structure. Now, we knew that we were going to be moving online and we had a, a two week window. Um, this team has an extraordinary, has more leaders because it has more students. We turned this over to the students. The first week we knew this was coming and said, we need a plan for the following week. And the students actually came up with a plan that, that met our, um, our, our, our criteria. And it, it's actually been working pretty well. And, and I'll, I'll show you this in a couple ways. But the, the student leader's plan was that we had a large meeting. Now we use um, an acronym that I know is, not socially appropriate in every place, but P-I-G-S, is progress issues goals. The idea that every project team shows three slides, progress, what they got done the last week, the problems that they got into during this last week, and what are their goals for the next week. And this rhythm that we use, and this was not a new online thing, we've always used this, but it translates really well online. It, it forces the students to summarize what they've gotten done, identify what are the challenges that they have that me as an advisor needs to look at, and what is the plan for the next week. And each of the teams would go through this. They also share general information with the large group. Now what this allows us to do is it allows us to survey where the teams are at very quickly. We can provide general information that's appropriate to the entire team at that time. But then what we do is we break into smaller teams. And what the smaller teams do is they go off into their virtual space and they sign up for a 15 minute session with our faculty. And they come into our meeting room so we have a smaller group um, over with that. We use electronic notebooks. Um, we use uh, Microsoft OneNote or um, in a combination with, with um, Google Docs. We, we use, almost always we use a Google Doc for the team reports um, that they could come in. So if I look at the meeting structure that I described, and, and I, I, this is my poor attempt at a graphic, what we do with that team is actually very similar to what we do with all the teams. We have a main meeting, and for us, we use a go-to meeting room that everybody comes into. Each of the sub-teams presents their progress issues goals. A good practice is to have a Google Doc that has it's formatted or has sections that students can write in to make comments or to ask you questions. Uh, one of the things that actually I learned on one of these sessions that I did from colleagues is when you look at some of these online tools with the chats, you can get very overwhelmed with what's going on with the chat. But if I've got a formatted Google Doc, it forces students to put things in sections and I can go back later. 
I can also even ask students, like I can say, hey, section one, just check in. How's this work been? How's your online connection been? I, I, I could ask them something about, you know, how they're feeling. Um, I, I, I can have them answer a question about uh, 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 their, their progress. I could ask them how their other classes are going. I, I can use that tool and it doesn't get lost and cluttered in, in the, the chatter. So that can be a separate thing while we have this. After the general meeting, and I've answered, we've disseminated the general questions and we're done with everything that everyone should need, we um, go to our own faculty room. Now this may be the same meeting room. Um, and then what we've done is we've scheduled some way, um, 15 minute blocks. This could be, if I'm doing this, I set a rotation. So when we go in, I just tell tell them when they're going to do this or I could have a little uh, sign up sheet um, I, online. For the EWB team, because it's so large, we let the, the student team sign up because some of them might wanna get together and talk amongst themselves before they talk to us so that they can put that time later um, in the hour. If none of the teams, um, you know, if, if I have a blank slot for the 15 minutes, um, we, we can let the other students know and if they've got a question they can ask. Otherwise, we, we can be there virtually and, and, and doing some other things. The teams go to their own meeting spaces. Now, pretty consistently what we do is give the students some ideas on what they can do, but we let the teams manage whatever software platform they want to to communicate. And honestly, it's been great. You know, the students get together and they say, oh, I want to do this or I prefer this. And we let the, the teams manage what they're doing in their own spaces. And then during the lab, we're checking in in more detail with, with every team. What that's done is it's allowed us to communicate with everybody. We don't have people just online, uh, not feeling productive. Uh, the, 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 teams, the team uh, meeting time goes pretty fast. Uh, peer evaluations. We, for all of our teams, just generally, we do peer assessments where they evaluate each other. I think in this virtual environment where we can't see people, I think that becomes even more um, important. Uh, peer evaluations can be as simple as sending a spreadsheet out for every student, asking them to fill in a, a rating or comments with the um, uh, for, for the other people um, I, on the team and, and emailing it back to you. Uh, I, I do believe whatever peer system that you have, having the ability to have students comment to you uh, confidentially, it is very important and, and an important part. Um, you could also do it in a way where, where you share uh, feedback back. Um, there is a small fee for the CAPME system, but this is if you're looking for software that, that uh, help, helps with Teams. Um, the, the CAPME is a, a great tool in all honesty and transparency. Uh, a faculty colleague in my uh, school here at Purdue is the one that leads that, but um, it, it, it's pretty well accepted um, globally. When we're assessing and we're looking at what the students are doing, uh, being virtual, it's very important for them to be producing things that you can look at to assess their progress and also so that we can assess them uh, for grades. I like to think of this as there's, there's two buckets. There's a team set of artifacts where everyone on that team, that team can be a large class or it could be a smaller project team. Um, what they're going to, to, to do so I can look at the actual project. Uh, if they do a, a common presentation next week for us, we have um, our, our design reviews um, that are going on virtually. I may send that info to Hans and uh, Krishna if, if you want to see what we do. Our, our partner communication, they're also design documents. Um, so just personally, when you have team-based documents, I, I don't spend uh, a huge time figuring out who did what part. 
there's some of these things we give a grade and, and the team shared. A challenge right now is that there's going to be less of the physical project artifacts, but I think it's important to remember that we do have um, common things that, that they can do in, in terms of reports and in documentation. Individual artifacts, I think this is important. You know, when, when the students are working, it's a challenge for us all the time to get the students to document what they're doing. Even when we're in person, it becomes even more critical in the online. So we have students keep electronic notebooks or, or, or blogs. We use the Microsoft uh, OneNote that, that's been pretty effective. Um, participation, every one of these team meetings, uh, we, we record a, attendance that, that they're actually there. The peer evaluations can be very helpful. They also come in to let us know if, if they're participating in these outside of um, lab meetings. Getting the students to write reflections, I, this is really, really, really critical to get them to write on what they're doing, what they're thinking, uh, what, what the experience uh, is, and I'll talk about those um, a, a little bit more. So making sure that you've got things that the students are recording that I can collect, I can collect electronically that gives me an idea on, on what they're learning, what their experience is. Uh, we're using this to, to check in how they are just as people um uh, also uh in this time now i mentioned reflection reflection is something that we should be doing in in all of our classes but in a project-based work it, it it's particularly uh critical uh what we want students to do it is examine evaluating and interpreting their experiences uh the experiences that they're they're having now are, are virtual and they're different but they're also having life experiences so I think it's helpful when you're looking at that, it is to check in uh, and, and to get them to write, to help them process. Uh, they're analyzing concepts, uh, posing questions, um, you know, getting them to, to clarify their, their personal professional values. Um, you can get them to reflect on any class, get them to, you know, asking them what, what um, for example, if I'm, I'm teaching a traditional class, I might ask them to, to write about an, an application of the, the content that we're doing, that we're covering in, in their everyday life, or, or maybe for their parents or, or their friends, is to get them to, to try to make a connection. These also become things that I can grade, I, I can look at, and I can give them feedback, which gives me another touch point. So if they're submitting something and I'm communicating back, even though they can't see me, we're communicating in a way and we're, we're creating a connection. Reflections can be different methods. Um, with our OneNote, we have a tab for reflections. So I can go to that, I, I can always look at that. Um, you can have them write essays or papers. For us at the end of the semester, traditionally, we would have them write a longer uh, final reflection uh, paper, they can be discussions, um, uh, throwing out a question and, and, and listening. Now the discussions are great, it, it doesn't give you an artifact to grade, but it's a valid way uh, to do this. You could give them something to read and, and their reactions or, or any type of combination. The learning benefits to reflection show that it, the amount that you do or the, the type, whether it's a formal or informal, written or oral, that, that those do not matter. It's to make sure that you're doing intentional, you're doing it regularly, and, and it's targeted toward the kinds of things that, that you want them to learn. A model for reflection that, that I like is the core, the majority of what you're doing at the center relates to the disciplinary things that we're doing. And then as I um, move out, we might talk about how they're feeling. Now this is an example from service learning the larger, you know, the social systems, the, the issues that they've got, getting them to think about, you know, the situation that we're in and, and what are things that we could do, especially as engineers, you know, moving forward, what are the, some of the things that we could do where we could leverage technology to make sure that this does not happen at, at this scale? I, I, again, are, are, are valid things to, to get them to think about. Um, we, um, 
use different questions. There aren't magic questions, but if you're looking at, you know, how would I start with reflection? There's these three, three questions that work for almost anything. You know, what did I learn? What did you learn? How did you learn it? Why does the learning matter? Um, we took a group to uh, Chennai and Valor from Purdue one uh, few years ago from, from Purdue University, and we actually gave them these three questions every day. Uh, and it was interesting uh, that, that we saw. So I could ask them a specific question that I want to get them to write. I could give them the freedom or, um, you know, I could ask them to write on, on this every week. Evaluating. Uh, evaluating project works always a challenge. I um, want to show you um, some of the, the tools that, that we use. For us, we put, if you look over here on outcomes, there are uh, five categories that we evaluate our students on. Accomplishments, what did they get done? Utilizing a design process, can they show uh, the course I teach is a design course? Do they show evidence that they're understanding design? They're critical and reflective thinking. We make that an explicit learning outcome um, for, for their uh, reflections, their teamwork and leadership. Now, this is an important thing that, that we've learned this the hard way, that when you're setting up criteria, if you've got teamwork or leadership, you want to make sure that the students can get the maximum grade for whatever role that they're in. That when we originally, when we did this in years past, we realized that if the students were a leader, they had a leadership role, they kind of got more points in the rubric. And that was not fair to the students and it created this weird incentive for students to want a title so that they could get more points that we've tried to make it that whatever role on the team you have, whether it's a leader or follower, you're evaluated on how well you do that role. Whoops. And then um, the communication, the, their, their ability to communicate, which is uh, confounded quite a bit um, with, with the virtual setting. Um, all of our evaluation information it, it is online. And when we get later, I'll give you an email if you want more. Um, information. Um, what we do is we give categories for excellent, proficient, competent, or does not meet expectations. We always ask the students when we do assessments to assess themselves, and then we give um, their uh, assessment. An important part that we found in assessment, and I, this is really true with, with portfolios and things, is we ask the students, where is the evidence of what you've done here? Where is it documented? Can we point, can you point us to where this is? If you want to show great understanding of design, you can't just say it's in my electronic notebook. Tell me what tab and what week um, and, and to get them. And by them pointing us to those things, it gives us a, a better, it, it makes it easier as an instructor. What we have for our grades, at, at my university, we give letter grades, A, B, C, D, um, and F. We skip the letter E for some strange historical reason that I don't know. Um, and what we have is we have the same rubric. We use the same rubric for all of our students, but we have a different uh, grading system for fourth year students. That's what the fourth means. A student that's going to get the top grade would get excellent in three of the outcomes that I just showed you, and proficient or better in the other two. There are no unexcused absences. They've met all of our requirements, and the, the professional development hours. I'd mentioned that earlier. The number of hours that they needed to fulfill were completed to get the top grade. A first-year student who's on that team needs to be proficient or better in three outcomes and competent or better in two. So we use the same rubric, we just don't expect the first year students to be able to achieve um, as much. And, and we, we can provide some more information over in that. But this tool has really allowed us to move online because what the students are doing are, are documenting things online. Um, we've just had to, recalibrate ourselves when we look at accomplishments, what are they accomplishing? 
an important part of what we found, and I think this is really, really true online, is we need to do some formative grading. We've always done, um, if we break a 15 week semester up into four different groups, the first four weeks we do a light grading. We just look at their documentation. I think this is important as they're documenting. Can I take a peek on what you're doing? For, for example, the reflections. Students um, very often are not writing enough. You know, how are you doing? Fine. If they, um, I know my own children, if they can answer a, a question in one word, and a lot of our students will do that, is they need to be coached and given feedback on how much we expect. Then halfway through the semester, we do a full grading and we give them, if the semester were to end based on the evidence that you've provided, and it's important in project work that we're grading them on the demonstration of their learning. And many students have said, yeah, but you know I was working hard. The analogy that I use is if it's not documented, I can't evaluate it. And the analogy I, I, I use is to a written exam. And I tell a student, if you came into my office before in a traditional class, um, and you were in my office and we talked about all the material, I started uh, quizzing you and you could answer every one of my questions. And I started putting, asked you to go to a whiteboard and I gave you really hard things and you could derive things from fundamental principles. You know, I could go into that exam thinking you might be my most brilliant student ever, but if you go into that exam and only sign your name and don't answer any questions and hand that test back, I asked the students, I said, what grade would you get? And every single one in every country I've been to would say, you get a zero. And I said, yeah, so you understand if I don't fill out the exam, I don't get a grade. But if you don't fill out your electronic notebook, you're not going to get a grade. And it, it, that's a similar type thing. The, the mid-semester grading for us is also a calibration exercise. So I think as we move to these online things, having a time where you say, we're just gonna do a preliminary evaluation, we're not recording this grade, but if, if, if you were to end the semester with what we're doing, this is the grade that I would give. And then when you're giving that, we have a conversation with the students. Most of the time it's very short. Here's what we would grade, this is what I need to see different, but it also allows the students to, to ask questions. Maybe there's something I miss. Um, maybe we need to make sure that we're calibrated so they understand your expectations. And then at the end of the semester, we repeat the same pro process um, when we're grading. We have a challenge right now because we've shifted over that we did the mid-semester grading based on in-person. And so we've done a preliminary check just to, to look at their documentation, if their documentation has stayed up uh, for that, but that process has worked. Now, a challenge for us, we use a, um, what we call a human-centered design process. And if you look at our design process that we use in our EPICS program, um, the, the, the half of it, the right-hand half is developing the design, and then the left-hand side is actually delivering the physical project and service and maintenance. <clears throat> It, in the virtual environment, it's almost impossible to go all the way through the cycle. So what we've looked at is what can we do in this right-hand um, side? One of the things that we can still do is we can do prototyping. And when we're looking at prototyping, now I will tell you, if you're doing project work and you're doing software projects, you've, you've very likely had an easier time uh, with this. Software projects can be delivered, a, um, uh, depending on the capability of the partner or client, they can be finished, they can be demoed, um, they can be tested, but they can also be when we're looking at prototyping. So, so I, I, I'll mention the software, but even with um, software, if I'm developing an app, an early prototype could be a paper, you know, sketches on what the screens would be. This is what, what things would be laid out. And even very fancy medical we'll equipment. we wind up soon. Okay. It's a time for questions, okay? Yep, yep, yep. Um, 
we can get them to do simple prototypes at their house using um, uh, simple materials. Uh, we can also look at projects that are going to fold in to the next semester. So I may recalibrate and, and tell people uh, what we're doing is going to lead into, at, at some point, we're going to come out of this. Um, I can look at what we can do with the uh, project. So if I go back to the human-centered design, spending some more time on what we know about the stakeholders, um, can I do personas? Can I do scenarios? Can we role play online what our partners might have looked looked at. Can I do things like one of the things that we shifted is make sure that we do like failure mode analyses. Can we do detailed analyses where we look at failure rates? Um, can we give them the, the scores? Can we spend some weeks looking at our concepts and doing a more complex analysis? Can we take times and look at some of the ethical issues? And, and to, to take some weeks. Um, can we look at, and I think it's to, to, to close, is being honest with the students that we're, we're gonna do some more learning, but, but use the opportunity to take time um, to, to do some of the analyses that we could do. The other thing that we can do, and, and I'll end on this slide just because I'll leave the, the email up, um, is to maybe even explore some new ideas. And this could mean exploring ideas for multi-institutional uh, projects. Uh, we've talked about getting some student teams together to virtually explore what projects could be. My interest is in the humanitarian, the peace engineering, some of these types of things. And that may be a project. And when I think about that, these things could take a semester. Um, we're interested in exploring that idea. Um, the email, the Epics University at, at Purdue, I, I want to clarify that, that we can't do projects with, with everybody. There, there are too many. But if, you, if you've got some ideas to give students maybe a cross-cultural experience, so they may not be able to build, but maybe we could get them use this time it, as an opportunity uh, for that. I will open it up for questions. All right, great, uh, Bill. Wow, that was a that was a lot. Okay, a lot to digest, and a lot of faculty, uh, a lot of people joined. The 500 people continuously in the session all the time. We've had to reject a whole bunch of people uh, at the same time because our capacity is 500. Uh, we will have a recording, so those of you who missed the you know, actually actual webinar can can join can be can will be sent, even if you just registered. Uh, let me just see if uh, some of our panelists have uh, any comments first before we move on to the audience. Uh, uh, let's go with Ramiro and 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 then Serene and uh, and Hans and um, Kyria and you got a few other people there. Ramiro, come in. Thank you, Bill. This was really enlightening, very practical. It has something that we can put our hands around. I want to thank you for being part of joining the call for action. I just um, very proud of working with you. So I'm just going to leave it at that. I think it was very enlightening. Serene. Come in, Serene. Hello? Yeah, Can come you in, hear yeah. me? Oh, yeah. me. Okay. Thank you, Krishna. Bill, that was dynamite presentation. Thank you so much. So very relevant. Lots of uh, good information that we all need these days. Um, I have a question and then an announcement if Krishna would uh, indulge me because it's uh, relevant to my question. The, the teams that you put together and uh, have performed online are uh, students that know each other from before, correct? The current group that we have, right. That, that's why in the, the slide I said what we're doing right now is going to be different than what we do in the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're gonna start our next semester, our summer semester in June, that that's gonna be a different experience and we're gonna have to, we, we are looking at what do we do at the beginning to help form those teams and be more explicit. So we're gonna be emphasizing 
the, the team, the building relationships uh, more. But yes, the, the flipping in some ways is cheating because they were together for seven weeks before that they did this. Yes. Thank you. The, the reason I asked this question is because we have just launched the virtual internship program uh, where all GDC member institutions will formulate virtual internship job descriptions for other universities and will hopefully be able to do some teamwork also uh, from uh, by students from China, from Chile, from Romania, uh, what have you. Uh, and it will be quite a challenge. It's the first time we'll have to do this. So we would love to compare notes with you. Hopefully you will also, uh, as an experienced uh, expert in this area, join and advise us. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Serene. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna give a chance to, um, uh, Kairia, if she would like to make a comment, and then Bill Williams, Dora Smith. Kairia, come in. Yes, thank you, Krishna. Hi, Bill. Hey. Um, uh, I'm really, you know, when you stress that it's their learning that's important, it's not about getting to the end product. I mean, you know, that is that is really something that is, I, I think we need to be reminded of. It's not really the end product that we want to show off it's about the students learning that's very important um so you know uh when you're saying that now your assessment um you know all the the students are not able to go to the labs and build those things uh i do you now have to change part of the outcome that is expected from uh the early part of the semester and how do you adjust to that so the the basic framework, it, 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 yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, the basic framework has stayed the same, but it, it's been um, tweaking the expectations. Like a lot of the students for the accomplishments, um, we, we had a goal that we're gonna have a, a physical working prototype that would be delivered. And so that's not gonna happen. And so we've had to go back and say, okay, what are we going to, what, what, what are we going to show that got done? So maybe we go back and we look at a failure mode analysis. We, uh, for some of the projects we've had to set, just because of the stage that they're at, set that aside. And so now we're gonna look at what would the next project be? Um, it, it's been a challenge for morale, but if I think of like that, uh, there, I, I can think of a team that works with a local children's museum that had three projects that they thought that were going to be finished and delivered. Well, if they finish that, the next team would have to come up with new project ideas. So we've shifted to say, we're not going to be able to physically build, but the next thing in the, the phase was going to have to be, um, you know, what's the next project idea? Or to go back and to look at, you know, were the user manuals completed? Um, can we do a, a draft on those? And what are the, what are the things that we needed to do? Um, we, we've also given them some different assignments. You know, I, I threw out a lot of ideas right right there at the end, but for example, is looking at, at, at a, a discussion on, on the ethical frameworks. It, it's, um, we often don't have time in a traditional semester to do a deep dive in ethical thinking and, and relate that to our project. And so we, we filled in, so we've, we've renegotiated with the students what their expectations are, but the, the idea that the reflections are still gonna be there, they've gotta demonstrate their understanding of design, they've gotta be able to communicate with each other, they've gotta be a good team. Um, may, that th those things for us have, have stayed. Um, and I don't wanna say, we, we have about 120 projects and I think that there are somewhere in the 20 to 30 that were, we threw our hands up and go, wow, this is a really hard thing to figure out what we shift to. But Bill, the, any, the, any the majority of it. Bill? Yes. Go ahead. Um, yes? This is Bill Williams here. Uh, Bill, I'm, I'm wondering about uh, uh, video submissions from students. Uh, I, I thought I'm, I've been thinking about this because with the lockdown, there's been, for example, a lot of musicians have been, you know, even 
orchestras have been putting together videos from their individual uh, 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 playing to create, you know, an orchestra playing. So I'm wondering, uh, have you considered some kind of collaborative video uh, submissions from students as ways of showing their, how, what they've been doing and so on? We we have, um, and and uh, um, uh, video or photos. What we've talked about are what can you do where you're at um, when we're looking at the prototyping you know getting to students to say you know you're all going to have to prototype different things and what do you have what do you have um at your at, um at, at your own home um we knew this was coming so some of the students took some things home uh we've been looking at ideas and it's not just for our class about maybe sending you know for the next semester can we send some kits to some student, so you know, one of them might be able to do. Hey, I'm, I'm mocking up the physical structure here. Um, I, I'm putting the Arduino together at this point, and I'm working with this other other student. Um, and and can I take pictures and um, video? So this next week, we're doing our design reviews, and so the students are bringing those products together. Um, and and uh, so. Uh, some of those things. It, it's getting the students to say, how how can you demonstrate the thing that you've done? Um, I, I also think it's important that we're we're realistic for the students. That that if I'm working on a, a a real project, we can't construct it, but we can get you know what are the things that we can do so that we're ready when we come back to campus to to make that easier. But the the videos and those things are are. Uh, are, are, are a good idea. Thanks, Bill. Uh, we're going to give Dara and uh, Kristen a chance if they want to speak. If they don't, that's fine too. Uh, Kristen? Hi there. Come in, Hi Dora. There. Yeah. Any, either, either of you have comments? Questions? Yeah, this is Dora, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, yeah, Bill, this was really interesting. And I just am curious, following on the thought of not being able to do physical prototypes. Do you find the, the opportunity to maybe do more, you know, digital prototypes, digital twins mm -hmm. in the future? Um, and yeah, you know, I'm, I'm here rep representing Siemens. I'm just curious if there's more you and other educators need from technology providers like us to, to better facilitate this kind of global project collaboration in the future. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think if we well, I when I think about this, it, so so there's there, there's products. There's also even just some coaching. So I mentioned like our professional development hours. It yeah. is getting um, you know if there's some virtual spaces to say, so how do I model um, these things? Or I'm doing this in CAD. Or, or here's some analysis tools that that we use. Is could could we share some of these? um things and, and get some practicing you know engineers that hey you know what i do this and if i'm coming in i i could help coach you uh in in some ways the virtual environment makes it easier but it it's a it's a challenge for us like in these a challenge doing the project work if you're doing authentic projects is you you may need such a diverse set of technologies and products that a single faculty member may not be an expert in this and to say hey do we have some experts in in cad here's a place you can go and and um learn some of those things that's what we do with our our skill sessions um which which is has made it uh, a a challenge an opportunity i think we have so when I think of students, they, what they don't do enough of are is the modeling, the the mathematical, the exploring options, doing a more rigorous um, uh, modeling and, and virtual testing of their ideas. And so I think for us as educators, there's a huge opportunity to say, could we improve those skills? Um, because in, in a semester, we're just going so fast is we jump to the build but but I'm, yeah. I'm assuming out in industry you know that you do a lot of things virtually and and with analytical tools
before you get to the construction and, and perhaps that what we can do is improve those skill sets for us as faculty and also for students. We need to move on to Kristen. Any comments from you, Kristen? Thanks, Laura. Kristen, anything okay. from you? Thanks very much. Thanks, William. That was really fascinating and extremely useful. Um, my um, lots of questions, but the one I think maybe focusing on from a student perspective, it, it sounds like the student needs to be um, more engaged in doc documenting their own learning. And I wonder, have you had the chance already to get feedback from students? How do they feel about that? Are they do they are they fed up because they feel like they're doing more work than they they would have done if they'd been on campus? Do they do they are they happy to take ownership of, of what they're learning and when? And 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 are they are they open to comparing, for example, with what they're what the, the other students are doing? So I'm interested from the student perspective. How are they um, kind of handling this additional responsibility that they've got? So, so that's a, a, a great question. Our students struggle with it. So our students need to do more documenting of their learning just in the project-based space anyway. And so there's a, there, that is always a challenge for us. Um, they're, um, so, so I'm, the 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 differential in what they've had to to document on their own because we've gone virtual has been a smaller jump between mm. what they do in a traditional class and what we do uh, the the students honestly are panicked about how they're going to be graded mm. and they are what what we're seeing it, it's hard to answer your question because there's so many chaotic things the yeah. students have lost their jobs or their internships. Yeah. They're not sure yeah. what next semester is going to be. They've had to move home. They're mm -hmm. online with everything. What mm -hmm. we've actually seen is these project teams where they can get together and we're telling them it's going to be okay is a less stressful place than others. Yeah. But but it's so confounded. It 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 it's hard to say. Okay. I I I thanks. Yeah. Thanks. We have a question. I'm going to move on to a few. Uh, uh, questions that have been sent to the chat box. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, uh, the the concept of virtual design versus the real design. I think that's an important issue, right? Now we are all online. So, how did you? How have you been able to uh, do uh, deal with that? Uh, having students do more of the virtual design, uh, the actual design now uh, prototypes. So, so what what we've tried to do is to break up what are the tasks that that you need to do. So our projects often last multiple semesters. So it's doing the, getting the students to say, okay, what do I need to do? We're gonna, for example, maybe we need to do personas on our, our users and we need to develop some scenarios. We need to develop so many different options. It is looking at the steps that we can work through. I, I mentioned like doing detailed failure analyses on, um, on a concept. You don't need the physical thing. Um, going more in depth in, in things like the ethics, looking at commercially viable options, uh, doing uh, case studies on existing products that we can compare our things to. So it, it's looking at what would be appropriate during a design process that doesn't require building. And many people want to know about your design review for information. So I, I guess you'll email me that and we'll send it to some of the. I, I, I will. The, so I'll tell you, if you're interested in our um, design reviews, if you would email the Epics University, you will actually get our person. I, I, will, I will send you the, the info too to email out. But if you said I would be interested in virtually participating in a design review to see how you do those, uh, we're we're happy to have you. You send an email there, and and um, Robin will will send that information out. Okay, uh, there are, there are lots of uh, really good questions still left. Uh, we're out of time, unfortunately. So I'll collect the information and see how we can what we can do to follow up. Hans, I'd okay. like you to uh, a chance to uh, to wind it up and say thanks to everybody. Hans, come in, Hans. Are you there, sir? All right, if not, I, I'm going to just uh, say thank you, okay. everybody, uh, for this exciting, uh, uh, attending this exciting webinar. Thank you, Bill, this has been terrific. I think, uh, uh, you yeah, know, this is uh, not easy. I think what you've shown is uh, it's not easy. So I admire, everybody should admire Bill for taking on this uh, daunting task of doing this and explaining to us. And uh, I don't expect that all of us will be able to do it, but maybe you can learn a little bit about it. 
about how to do these things step by step. It actually sounds like more work to do these things online than uh, than doing face to face, right, Bill? Uh, yes. <laughs> Bill, I just want to take a, a, just a second here. First of all, really thank you for your very thoughtful presentation. You're a wonderful representation of the complexity and diversity of our global community in IFES and GDC and IUCE, and particularly your reflection about cross-cultural reality experiences. How can, for example, your students, which are part of the U.S. reality, share those experiences with uh, students and faculty in the other continents that we work with? And how to create stronger linkages that those kinds of dialogues can, can really happen? I would love to hear and other, and we are reaching out uh, to our members in all continents, including Africa and Asia and the UAE all that for them also to share their experiences, thereby even deepening the dialogue and reflection in our global community. Keep up the wonderful work, Bill. Thank you very much. And thank mm -hmm. you all. On the same note, uh, as Hans just mentioned, we will be switching to a mode where we will seek your participation rather than just experts talking to you. We want you. There are 500 people of you out there. I know at least 50 or 100 of you have been trying out things. We want you to reach out to us Send an email to me or to Hans, or uh, and 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 uh, we will I give you an opportunity to give short webinars, not uh, maybe a, a ten-minute webinar, fifteen minutes, share with each other. So you please reach, send us email saying that because the exciting thing that we are trying out, we want to share. Uh, give us ten minutes at the next webinar. So we'll structure webinars in future. We will have several people give short webinars and share. I think that's an appropriate way for the to build the community of learning that we're trying to encourage. So thank you all for joining and thank you. Uh, Bill, and thank you, and everybody be safe, be happy, and healthy. Goodbye, good night, good evening, wherever you are. Bye-bye.